because yeah. I've got very loud voice and, and knowing James and having shouted him on a cricket field and he's uh, he's also got a loud voice. Yeah. Well. So we'll be okay. Yeah, it's funny. Nigel mentions mentions the the German connection there. My my father is German, so you know where's that where's, where does that come into this? Um, kind of cricket in Germany is what what got me interested in wider cricket beyond beyond the UK. I find myself interested in the, the German national team. I was googling their results, and that in a way led me to writing for Wisdom. I, I co edit a section with James, and we've done it for about. 12, 10, 10, 12 years now called Cricket Around the World, which is cricket in obscure and, and kind of interesting places where maybe you don't associate the game. You know, we've, we've featured everywhere from kind of Zanzibar, Antarctica, A to Z basically of uh, the wrong way around there, but A to Z of, of, cricket, <laughs> of cricket around the world in, in places you don't associate. So when James and I were, were kind of editing these, these articles and every year we get correspondence filing from from all around the world, we, we kept thinking there must be more of a story in some of these. There must be more of a, a kind of interest in, in some of these. There must be more, let's, can we get below the surface of, of some of these? And, and perhaps one of the major inspirations kind of for the book is that we looked in the world where, where where's cricket been written about? Okay, it's been written about in Asia. It's been written about in Europe. It's been written about in Africa. It's been written about in Australasia and, and, you know, and wherever. It's been written about in North America. There's a, there's a couple of books on cricket in the USA and Canada. Where's the one continent that was missing a piece of literature from that time? It's South America. It's South America. There must be stories. Argentina could have been a, could have been a test nation. And that was really what kind of drove James and I towards, towards this subject matter. Mm. I mean, you know, I think anyone who's studied the history of the game will be aware that there has been a footprint in, in, in Argentina. There's been a footprint in South America. Um, you know, if you go back and look through the archives of the Cricketer magazine, sorry for the shameless plug, um, <laughs> there's an awful lot on cricket in South America. Um, if you go back through the years, you know, Plum Warner took a tour there in 26, 27. Um, uh, Lord Hawke in 19, 11, 12, you know, these are major uh, figures in cricket history, but also there's a huge amount of stuff in the present day. And we thought, can we knit together this slightly forgotten um, archive uh, material that's sitting around in, in magazines and so on with the present day testimony of people that have played the game, that have run the game, uh, people in, you know, women in Brazil playing today, people all over the continent. And can we make a great story out of this? And it really had been neglected, to be honest with you. Um, and we thought this needs someone to flesh it out properly and do it, give it due diligence. And what better way to do that than to do what they did in Race Across the World and stay in a hostel for a few months and just travel through the continent and stay with people and uh, stay Yeah, so, so I should say at that point, we, we quit our jobs to do this. Yeah. We quit our jobs. We were, James, James at that time was, was assistant editor at Wisdom. Uh, I was working for a company in, uh, in the Northwest of England that, that covered football for, I was covering Liverpool and Manchester United and the big clubs every week. And, uh, and yeah, we, we, we just, we felt so much belief in this project that we, we, we ditched our jobs and we, we, we went, we, we, we booked a flight uh, to, to Cancun in Cancun. Mexico. And, and away we want. Football's an interesting one. Pele said, you know, obviously you eat, sleep, drink football in, in, uh, in, in Brazil and in, in South America. Now, I have to tell one anecdote before we get into the, to the kind of major, major things. There's a great story with Frank Keating, who was a legendary writer for, for The Guardian. And, and Frank Keating went to interview Pele one day. And, and en route to meeting Pele with his friend from ITV, he had a couple of a couple of drinks and he was perhaps by the time he turned up a little bit the worse for worse, shall we say. So Pele's turned up and he's looking, you know, resplendent in his peak as a player. And and, and Frank sat opposite him and you know they're having a bit of chit chat before the main the main interview on, on ITV and, and Frank's little piece with him. And uh, he, he says to Pele, oh, you know, kind of what have you been up to? And he says, Oh, I've, I've just been from I've just come from Italy to uh, I've been to see the Pope. And Frank, with a kind of, kind of glint in his eye, and a bit, he says, "Would that be George Pope, the former uh, Derbyshire uh, all-rounder who played one Test for England?" And I don't know how Pele answered him, but uh, yeah, it was a wonderful, wonderful little tab. But yeah, it's a continent which is swathed in football, but cricket got there first. Mm. And interestingly enough, we went to, you know, Rosario, which is in Argentina. That's where Lionel Messi's from. Cricket was played there since eighteen seventy something. Um, where Luis Suarez is from, Salta, Salta or Salta? Salta, Salta in Uruguay, just over the river from Argentina, just in Uruguay. 
Uh, that was played there in the 1870s by corn merchants or something started the club. Uh, and obviously Maradona grew up on the edge of um, on the edge of Argentina, on the edge of Buenos Aires, in a very poor suburb. Um, and cricket was played in that in that part of Buenos Aires as well. He did actually see the game. I think he saw an IPL game on TV, and he sort of turned around to his friends and said, "What are they doing? Why are they jumping around when the ball hits the sticks?" He didn't quite get it, but uh, I think he would have made a decent cricketer probably if he wanted to. He'd been a good little nuggety left-hander, I think, <laughs> in the Australian mould probably. But um, uh, yeah, so. Um, you know, it's an interesting, you know, that's an interesting what if that I suppose we'll get into that, you know, football is massive in, in South America, probably bigger than anywhere. But in every single one of the countries we went to, cricket got there first. Uh, so it's a massive what if. So, yeah, we, as I said, we, we, we quit our jobs and we arrived in, in Cancun. We went to our first, we played our first game in Cancun, which for those perhaps who are the uninitiated is this, uh, this kind of party resort, basically. But so while everyone else was out kind of nursing hangovers on a, on a kind of Sunday morning in Cancun, we were we went to play cricket. You have to play the game there at 8 a.m. in the morning because it gets so hot at the midday time. You, you just cannot play. You cannot play at that time. And also the mozzies start to come down at a kind of, you know, three in the afternoon when the sun goes down. So you have, you have to kind of play in that time. But we really knew, James, didn't we? When, we, when we were playing the game that we'd arrived in South America, when we were, we were just padding up, waiting to bat. And out of nowhere, I mean, we weren't, you weren't, not expecting this two days in a scorpion just come <laughs> scuttling by and and one of the players one of the players there just grabbed the stump and just <laughs> put the scorpion to its uh to its death uh, us being soft europeans were willing to let it go well, <laughs> he knew far too well yeah we too wanted to put in a box and rehouse it in the woods or something <laughs> like that. but yeah they have a in, in cancun they have a they have a three-step rule because the boundary is all jungle the boundary is all jungle so they have a, they have a three-step rule if the ball goes it's over the boundary you can't go more than three steps because there's, you know, crocodiles and panthers and all sorts of things in there that you better, you know, not, not something we're used to in England when the ball, you know, you might get a stinging nettle or a, a bramble or have to climb over barbed wire, but there, you know, you're watching out for all sorts of kind of crazy creatures. I mean, to be honest, it, it was, it, we thought if this is like this everywhere, I don't know how we're going to get the book done, <laughs> but actually it was the one place we went to where you did see signs saying warning crocodile or warning, <laughs> I think probably because it was a tourist sort of haven they had all these sort of signs up warning you about it, but it was every man for himself after that. But um, yeah, that was a bit of a rude awakening, that one. It was very, very hot there, very humid. And I think we both thought, if it's like this the whole way, I'm not sure how we're going to do it. Fortunately, you know, there's incredible uh, uh, scale and breadth of the climate. It's very different from one place to another. You know, you go from volcanoes to, you know, sweltering jungle, whereas this was very much the sweltering jungle bit, really. Yeah. So then we, we headed up to, uh, to Mexico City, uh, where, which is a, a very kind of old ground that's obviously a bit more at altitude there. Uh, there was a very famous game played there between um, when the England footballers went there in, I think it was 85, actually. It was a year before the, before the World Cup. So they kind of, Bobby Robson took them out there to, to kind of acclimatise and get used. They played in a, a kind of tournament the year before, uh, before 86 in the famous Maradona Hand of God. Uh, and yeah, there was a, you know, when, when they went there, Bobby Robson, I don't even know, he's a, he's a big cricket man as well as a, as well as loving, as well as a, you know, the England football manager. And he encouraged his players to play a game of cricket against the Mexico City Cricket Club. So there's, again, there's a picture in the book of, you know, John Barnes strapping on the pads and Gary Lineker, who's a very, very good cricketer, of, of course. And they went out to bat at altitude against, uh, against the local cricket club. So what an experience. I and mean, you couldn't imagine it now, could you, you know? The England football team playing, you know, playing the local cricket club. It's just multi-millionaires. It's, it's kind of unimaginable, really. Well, I mean, yeah, I don't think that, I don't think the, the, the agents would have liked that too much. They'd have been asking for image rights or something. So I don't think it would work now. But, um, yeah. And then Bobby Moore had played there in 1970 as well. I think uh, with their, obviously, the 1970 World Cup, they'd had a bit of a kick around and, and, a, and a hit around as well. Yeah, Jeff Hurst, of course, the, uh, uh, played first-class cricket, up at, uh, played one game, I think, up at Liverpool. Essex yeah, for Essex. For Essex, you know, a very, very good wicketkeeper and, uh, and batsman. So, yeah, good, good. In fact, he was actually, it was uh, unwittingly, it was cricket which brought Jeff Hurst to, uh, to, to, Al, to, to, to England's kind of uh, prominence. Because he was actually, Jeff, I don't think anyone knows this story, but Jeff, Jeff Hurst was actually, came back late to training uh, I think this was 63 or 64. He came back late to training because he was thinking he could crack it. 
uh, came out late to train with West Ham because he's thinking, I can crack it as a cricket player. And he actually came back late to training. Uh, so all the players were much fitter than him. And then in one game, he was actually played up front because he couldn't keep up with the pace of the game. He started out in midfield, Jeff first, And they put him up front and he scored a couple of goals. And it was from there that he actually, his, his kind of career as a, as a centre forward kind of really took off. Anyway, that's a, that's a separate story. But yeah. So yeah, we went, we went north from Mexico City then to a place called Pachuca. Uh, which we found the most the most unusual thing there. Yeah, that, uh, I mean, yeah, all the things you sort of expect in Mexico, you know, tequila, um, very hot tacos. Um, what they actually have in Pachuca is they have a Cornish pasty. Now, it's not quite a Cornish pasty. It's a Cornish pasty with a twist. You can imagine it's a bit hotter, probably. Um, well, it is a bit hotter. And they used to serve these in tea breaks in the, in, in the early 20th century, late 19th century, when Cornish miners went out to Mexico to work in the tin mines and the silver mines uh, yeah. and, and all, all, all that sort of industry. They had satchels and they slept all the way across these mountains to, to Pachuca and they brought the Cornish pasty with them. So when they when they started their own cricket clubs in these places, in jute mills and in various mines, they had, what did they serve at tea break? They served, the, they might serve some sandwiches, they might serve some cider, but they also served the Cornish pasty. And that's still there today when you go to these sort of mountain country just outside Mexico City, which to us was a massive surprise and a pleasant one as well. So we we'll see, we'll definitely sampled a few of them. They were particularly, particularly delicious. So yeah, we, you know, we, we, we got all we could out of Mexico. Wonderful, wonderful, huge, vast country. It was kind of played kind of all over there. And then we went to we, we, our next port of call geographically was down to, down to Belize, which was you know, a country, I must be honest, before we went there, I, I knew little about. Mm, yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of a slight um, uh, one-off apart from Guyana. You know, the only English-speaking country on mainland Latin America, I think. Um, really uh, an unusual, but a great place to go. I, mean, I vividly remember walking down the main thoroughfare uh, and uh, Tim obviously being close to seven foot and me being close to, to, to five foot. I do remember one guy coming up to us and saying, hey, man, have you asked him what the weather's like up there? Which I did find <laughs> amusing. Um, so yeah, there was, was a lot more sort of um, knockabout humour, possibly. I think because obviously you know being an English-speaking country, um, and yeah, and, and amazing. And there's a little sort of enclave of just inland from the from the main city, Belize City, which is beset by hurricanes. I mean, you know the history of this place getting absolutely battered by hurricanes coming off the coming out of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, uh, but yes, uh, there, there's a little enclave of cricket uh, clubs there with great names, with, with bizarre names, you know, like. Uh, I think I've, I've, I've made a note of some of them. Excellence of double head cabbage. That's one. <laughs> Brilliant of crooked tree. That was a good one. Now, they actually have a special uh, a drink there that we sampled beforehand, and things didn't go so well after that. Uh, they they made drink from the uh, from a cashew fruit, not the nut, but the cashew fruit. So that was an interesting experience. So yeah, there, there was an amazing little sort of enclave of cricket, almost slightly West Indian, slightly Latin American, um, and there was a great story in the sixties where there was a, a game broadcast on the radio at Belize. It was known as British Honduras then. Um, and, um, and, uh, there was a, there, and there was a whole, the police team were playing against somebody else. And the police team had an 11 entirely called Tillit. So as, as one Tillit got out, caught by Tillit, bowled off another Tillit, because there were a few Tillits on the other side, um, another Tillit came in. <laughs> and there's a Tillit was a scorer as well. So and the um, umpire was Tillit. The umpire was Tillit. And the guy so, in the radio commentary was called Tillit. So, <laughs> so yeah, it was an interesting sort of um, family game. So yeah, that was a, a lovely little offshoot and a bit different to the other places that we went to. And then we went into Central America after that. And yeah, but there was a, there's, there's a also a wonderful thing in Belize when you know in, in England we're very we're very precious about you know the grounds when are very precious about their wicket they're very like must be prepared in a certain way you know if there's a hint of rain the covers have got to come on straight away and, and, and rightly so but in Belize James they have a they have a slightly different way if, they, if it's a bit if the game might not be on because of a bit of a bit of rain what, what, say what they do and I've got to say this is something that we saw copied throughout all of uh, Central yeah. America and not just Belize but um, yeah it was an interesting way of doing it they you know we obviously have had a lot of trouble uh, filling up our cars recently um, and um, they would worry less about that because they used to use gasoline, sprinkle it on the pitch, set fire to it, and there would go the, the excess grass and the damp. <laughs> One way of getting rid of the, uh, of the damp on the wicket. And so you'd get a scorched earth pitch, which I imagine would play well for spin, but who knows? I mean, we've never played on, we didn't get to play on one. It was no, a long we didn't. time while we were there. And even, even they didn't like the pitch for us. So um, yeah, 
that was an interesting way of dealing with wet pitches. I'm not sure we can, uh, you know, next time it's raining at Lords, I'm not sure we can get the, the game on by uh, proposing that as a solution. I don't, I, I don't think. <laughs> so yeah, from there we went to we went to uh, to cent more to Central America, Latin, more Latin America, um, to Guatemala, where there was a, a wonderful story about about Christian missionaries who who started cricket there as a way of kind of helping those who would uh, were involved with gangs come away from being involved in gangs to, to actually play, play cricket instead as a, as a way out. But probably probably the most, the most uh, well-known uh, of, of, of all Latin American cricketers, if, if you can pass them in that way, is, is George Headley, who was, who was born, in, born in Panama. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, certainly at the time, I, I think, you know, people can dispute this with me if you want to, feel free to. Um, but I think certainly from my reading of it, um, you know, there was Bradman and in terms of playing on wet wickets, Headley was up there with him and, you know, Wally Hammond obviously was there at the same time as well. But, you know, in terms of the great batsman of his time, he was certainly up there. Uh, and he, he, you know, he, the reason he was in Panama was because his father, um, well, one third of Barbadian males had emigrated to Panama to work on the Panama Canal, to work on building the Panama Canal for the USA. And, um, and so... His father was there and actually suffered a terrible injury. We discovered this in the course of the research. He almost lost his life and almost lost a limb uh, through working on the Panama Canal. It was an incredibly difficult uh, and arduous work for most of these people. Uh, these West Indians guys put in a lot of hard work for not much money. Uh, it's very difficult. And um, but his, so his dad had emigrated from Barbados and his mum had come from Jamaica uh, and they met in Panama. And, uh, and George Headley was born on, on the uh, Atlantic coast of Panama. Uh, and spent his first 10 years there and actually in Colon, in Colon, in Colon, uh, yep. Colon Panama, at the end of the Panama Canal. And he spent his first 10 years not really speaking much English, speaking more Spanish, playing baseball. Uh, and then they reckon that the reason his reflexes were so good, the reason why he was so good at, at cross batted shots, the reason his eye was so good was because he played baseball, which is a fascinating little nuggets that we found out that really haven't been aired before, which were. A real a real honor really to find out that stuff because it's you know this is one of the great batsmen of all time and to find out any new information on one of the great batsmen you think it's all been done before you think there's nothing else to say but it was it, it was really wonderful to find out that and we went to the church where he'd been as a kid uh, we met the warden of the church and had a little look around way where, where he'd been as a little chorister um in panama and yeah it was just a quite humbling in many ways that 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 period yeah, one of, one, of the, one of the kind of fantastic things about, we, you know, everyone knows the story of Don Bradman, you know, famously hitting the golf ball against the wall to hone his technique. But Headley had a, a slightly different, you know, he, he was able to be a master of, of, of a different technique. Well, that's right. I mean, obviously, a lot of the wickets in, I mean, he didn't play any cricket in, in Panama. So, you know, he was, you know, it's in terms of his, as a kid, his, as a kid. his fielding. Yeah, it was in terms of his fielding and his, and his, and his sort of hand-eye coordination and, you know, there was, a, there, was a, there was a story about when there was a baseball game in Panama and he jumped in front of the crowd and um, someone was going to get hit on the head and managed to catch the ball, just the boy in the crowd, saving someone from injury. So even then he'd shown, uh, he'd shown his mastery. And when he, when he went to Jamaica and started learning cricket, uh, he was ahead of the others because, you know, because he was so, uh, you know, his hand-eye coordination was such, you know, his catching was better than everybody else. He was keeping wicket without any gloves on, stuff like that. Fairly extraordinary. So yeah. but later in his career, he did go back and uh, when he was, you know, more, he became George Teddy, the George Teddy that we, mm. you know, we, everyone knows about. He actually did master some skills batting in, in Panama on in touring matches That's that right. were that were related to the, to the wickets. Yeah, I think because of the way, um, you know, there were a lot of boats going to and from Jamaica to the Panama Canal. And when they went to Australia, for instance, I think West Indies tour of Australia 2930, I think it was. Someone will probably correct me on that, but. Uh, um, they had to go via Panama to get to Australia. So they would, they, all the West Indian teams would stop off in Panama and play games there. Um, and they would play against the local people that were working on the canal or whatever. And, he, and, and these were very much the sort of scorched earth wickets we're talking about where they'd chuck the gasoline on and get the game on. And so he would, you'd, you'd have him coming up against someone bowling fairly quick and he would you know, hook people into the stands. And yeah, he, was, um, he had those moments. And, and the thing is... When he came back from the ship from Australia, you know, thousands of people, thousands and thousands of, 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 of black Panamanians came out to greet him and exalt their hero because, you know, they got the news through from the Telegraph or from the or from the newspapers about what he'd done there. So you can only imagine the sort of ferment and the and, and the passion for what he'd done in Australia and in England and all, all over the world. Really, fairly extraordinary. Yeah, and, the, and and a lot of this book is about 
you know, that you know, it's it's not just telling the story of those cricket. It's it's a lot about the the kind of the nation building that took place. The Panama Canal is a is a is a great example of that. You know, the the, the West Indian immigrants who came in there who had to battle diseases and yellow fever and, and whatever, and they were building this canal and and they brought cricket with them. And that and that was a kind of you know that was a theme that cropped up a lot in the book. It, it, it was perhaps historically like that, and in a more modern, it, it tends to be. You know, bankers from India or IT consultants from India. You know, we'd we'd come to uh, we'd turn up in La Paz in Bolivia, and and was you know people working in IT from India, and they were the guys who were bringing that you know that kind of later generation of mm. of, of kind of cricket through. Mm. So yeah, obviously Panama is um, you can't. I mean, there is there is a Pan American highway that you can drive. I mean, we didn't do this by the way. We you know we found we went on buses, we went on planes, we did a we did, we did all sorts really. We took boats where necessary, but you can't drive through Panama to South America. So obviously it's the last little sliver of Central America. And you, there's something called the Darien Gap. And the only people who go through there are drug dealers. You can't <laughs> go through that bit. So you do have to hop over into, into South America from there. Um, but there is a Pan-American highway that goes all the way down, but it stops in, the, in that little gap between Panama and Colombia. So we did find our way into Colombia from there. Uh, and then maybe Tim can take up the story here. Yeah, well, the, the Darwin Gap's interesting, really. You know, it's uh, there are some people and some backpackers who venture through there, but we were we were kind of driven by cricket, really. Wherever we went, the, you know, we, we Belize, be, be, yeah. Belize is <laughs> good point. Uh, Belize is a good example. Or, you know, we saw a lot of backpackers, and they were they were off going to what are called the K Colcas, which are these beautiful, beautiful kind of islands where you can go snorkeling, and you know, you can see beautiful. Uh, beaches and and James and I were in gritty kind of Belize city where no tourists ever went or, or Guatemala city where you wouldn't see anybody else another European there because everyone's gone to the the picturesque kind of colonial town Antigua. yeah yeah Antigua and well, everyone's got a picturesque colonial town so so that kind of brought its own unique challenges but yeah we weren't quite uh, we weren't quite brave enough to try and get through the Darien Gap thinking you know if we tried to if we had, we had, we had cricket bats in the back of our rucksacks and if we were trying to explain what we were doing to to FARC or whoever they might not quite get what we're uh, what we're kind of going on about or what we've got maybe hidden inside the uh, inside the cricket bat. Uh, so yeah, from there we went on to uh, to Ecuador, uh, which is a very high altitude country, incredibly incredibly beautiful country. I've, I've got to be careful what I say about Ecuador, as this is on Zoom. And I'm not sure if my wife is; she's half Ecuadorian, so <laughs> I better say only positive things about about Ecuador. But yeah, it's an incredibly uh, high altitude country, and, and and the ball cricket ball actually behaves slightly different at altitude. This is not something that that conventional cricketers face that often. But the ball behaves slightly differently through the air, and we actually visited uh, not only the altitude but also the um, the equator. Yeah. So we we went to the equator and uh, we tried to kind of do a bit of an experiment with a cricket <laughs> ball on the uh, on the line of the equator to see to see maybe you could get a, a that's it. See if we could you know see if we could flush a different way. See if the ball would behave differently. But the findings were a little bit inconclusive. <laughs> I mean, I can't swing the ball in England, so I don't know if they would swing it on the equator. I mean, I don't know how he doesn't swing. You swing your ball so slowly. <laughs> um, so yeah, maybe that, that was. I mean, yeah, we, we obviously going back to Mexico briefly. That was the second highest round in the world in Mexico City. So we, you know, turf wicket, turf, turf, sorry, turf wicket. Yeah. So the ball does fly further, definitely. You know, you can tell when you're out in the field, the ball seems to just hang in the air a bit longer. Uh, so that's the major difference in terms of when you're playing. That's what you notice the most. The other thing I'd say. But that's a very good point. The ball does fly further. It's when you're trying to take a run. So you've run one, all of a sudden coming back to two, you can feel a heart beating. If anyone's ever been climbed a mountain or anything, you're out of breath. Three, forget it. Don't even bother going for three because you're just, you, you know, you, you're too out of breath. It's just, it's just not possible. That's right. Um, so yeah, um, we, yeah, Ecuador was interesting. They, 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 I think there's a few, there's been a few games where they've had a local, I mean, the, the food is interesting or wherever you go in South America. Um, one thing they serve in Ecuador is guinea pig, unbelievably. Um, and we didn't come across any games where they were actually serving guinea pig, but we have been told that it had been served before. So we were lucky for you to avoid that one. But that wasn't even the most unusual, probably. If you go to, where, where, if you think about Costa Rica. What, oh, what, goodness. I mean, that wasn't in terms of food. Belize. Belize, Belize yeah. Belize, yeah, Belize, that was an interesting one. Yeah, Belize. Afternoon tea, roasted iguana. Roasted iguana. Yeah, that <laughs> how, would that, how would that go down? Apparently it's not endangered. But, um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, we, we, didn't, we didn't have any, just for the record. So, 
Yeah. And I think I think it's actually outlawed now. Is it? Uh, in, no, no, not there. But in, in oh. Costa Rica, yeah, Costa Rica, it was uh, they frequently had turtle for yeah. afternoon tea as well. Yeah, so yeah, that was uh, that is out, that is outlawed. Although when we were there, we meant we brought this up with a chap. We said, oh no, he was involved with the, was involved with the cricket there. He said, oh, we heard you used to have kind of turtle for for afternoon tea. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want some? I can. Isn't it outlawed? He said, yeah, yeah, but you want some. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, we were like, oh, no, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll stay clear of that one. He obviously didn't think we were inspectors from a local food standards <laughs> authority, well, which is funny, actually, because when we went elsewhere, people did think we were from the ICC. We did get asked that question. So are you spies from the ICC? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> you mean the International Criminal Court? No, 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 the, uh, the International Criminal Court. <laughs> yeah, so we did get asked that a few times if we were spies from the ICC. Um, we weren't the record. Yeah, so from yeah, from Ecuador, it was it was onto Colombia, which you know for for a lot of people was kind of you know they associate it with you know, violence and killing and you know brutal drug uh, Pablo Escobar etc. But we actually encountered a country that was that was very different from that. It was uh, it's actually a very open country. The the people there are very keen to put behind uh, the past, what happened in the, in that kind of era, and it was actually one of the most friendly and, and kind of open countries which really you know when I told my mum you know we're in Colombia she was frightened to death what might what might be going on but that really is a kind of outdated kind of attitude really and an outdated view of the country it's a it's a magnificently open and, and beautiful country and and yeah we really enjoyed our time there that being said there is a cricket connection with Pablo Escobar which, uh, which we did on earth um, Pablo Escobar's son actually played cricket who would have thought it but it was his illegitimate son. So he had a, shall we say, a non-consensual encounter uh, when, he was, when he was 16. Uh, and the result of that non-consensual encounter was uh, a chap called Roberto Sendoya Escobar. Uh, Pablo didn't know about this, 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 this son of his. Uh, he didn't have no idea. The, this, this young boy, his baby, was uh, unable to be brought up by the mother because she... She had problems and she, she ultimately died. Um, so he got adopted by a British family. It was a guy who was uh, called, um, Philip. He, he's now known as Philip Whitcomb. And he was sent off when he was 12 years old from, from Bogota. He spent his early time in, in Bogota, his early years. But, but kind of Pablo got wind that this, this lad was knocking about. So, so he sent him to boarding school in England. And boarding school in England, of course, meant cricket. So young Pablo Escobar's son played cricket. He uh, went to Lucton School in, uh, in Herefordshire. Uh, he was a wicketkeeper and a, and a batsman. Said he wasn't much good at batting. He used to try and smack it everywhere. But he was a wicketkeeper. And yeah, who thought it? Pablo Escobar's son played cricket, which was quite a, quite a remarkable thing. That wasn't the only connection to Escobar and cricket that we found. Pablo Escobar actually laundered his, laundered his money through a company some of you may remember in, in kind of the 90s and, and 80s, a company called BCCI. Not to be confused with Indian Cricket. Not to be confused, <laughs> which we do spell out. The acronym is... Not to be confused with, of course, uh, to be clear. cricket in India, but uh, it got dubbed uh, the Bank of Crooks and Criminals International. That's the one. Yeah, that's the one. They, got, they, they laundered the money for all you know, Saddam Hussein... Gaddafi, they all laundered their money through this uh, through this bank, and, and Escobar laundered his money through that bank as well. And those uh, bank employees who were based in Bogota, a lot of them were overseas, and a lot of them were, you know, from from India or from from Pakistan. Uh, and of course, they they played cricket. So the guys who were dealing face to face with Pablo Escobar were on the weekend playing cricket. So it's uh, an interesting little uh, little dynamic. We couldn't quite find out whether they brought up, you know, what the averages were in the Bogota Cricket Club with Pablo or, or whether he would, you know, sponsor the, sponsor the game at the weekend or whatever. But it was, uh, yeah, an interesting connection nonetheless. Absolutely. Yeah, so, um, I mean, you know, obviously you're then going down the, the West, we sort of worked our way down the West Coast, went through Peru. Funnily enough, with Peru, uh, obviously Lima is the capital and um, it's it hasn't had lost a single ball to rain since something like 1860 something it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's so dry there that ground it's right by the sea and, um, and obviously the, the the Andes going down the going down the west coast that they haven't lost a single ball to rain although when we played there one day it was very very misty and we thought it was going to rain for sure there's going to be some condensation in the air nothing 
absolutely nothing. Yeah, no. Lima's just nestled in that the Atacama Desert runs its way down the coast of uh, down the coast of South America of, Ch of Chile and, and and Peru and and yeah, it's it's a very dry, arid, arid kind of place. And in the in you know, going way back, it was, it was British mining influences there, which which brought cricket there. And they were playing cricket in the desert, just with a piece of concrete for a for a matting in the sweltering heat. And this was kind of in the you know the late eighteen hundreds. I mean, it must have just been unbelievably intolerable conditions. You know, we hear about today. We hear about when when tour, when England go and tour in Pakistan or Sri Lanka. It's, oh, it's unbelievably hot. But these guys were miners. They were working in the mines and then coming out and playing a game in the desert. I mean, it really must have been something mm. something else. I mean, and funny, you know. We obviously, when you go down from Peru, you go into Chile, and Chile, I mean, you know, it's, an, it's I think it's the longest country in the world. You know, it starts off in very similar conditions, sort of desert landscape, lots of mining, uh, very arid, and then you go all the way down to Punta Arenas, which is right in the south, almost, you know, on the edge of Antarctica, um, and incredibly cold. Uh, and there was, a, the, in Punta Arenas did have a cricket club, if you go way back, um, and um, it, it was it was, what was, it was it very was, famous, uh, very famous story when when Ernest Shackleton was uh, and his and his men were stranded on Elephant Island trying to do a one of the the, the, the Antarctic uh, expeditions. Um, he he came, I think it was him and, and two of the two of the chaps came to to Punta Arenas trying to trying to arrange a rescue boat to rescue their twenty three men who were. Eating seals and you know desperately keep playing football on the ice floats, desperately trying to keep themselves you know kind of warm. I think they were there for twenty three days, something like that, trying to stay alive. And when Shackleton got to Punta Arenas, the people he looked up to help him were the cricketers. The cricketers of Punta Arenas were the people who rallied round, got the money together to to get a, a rescue boat. And obviously he was able at the third time of asking was able to go and get a, a rescue boat and rescue his men off off, off Elephant Island where they were. You know, kind of be frozen to uh, frozen to death otherwise. Mm. Yeah, and um, uh, in Chile, obviously, the, you know, as I say, incredibly long country, and you've got Santiago and Valparaíso, which is a lovely city just west of that. And there, Argentina being the strongest country in, in cricketing country in South America, there was once a team that actually trekked across the Andes to get to Chile and play in Chile, and so they took a train all the way along from Buenos Aires to. I think uh, Mendoza, obviously wine country in Argentina, if you know Argentina, and then they and then they took mules, I think, from from there to get across the Andes. This is before the Transandine Railway was built, and so that, I think it took them how many days? I, can't remember. I think it's twelve days. Twelve yeah. days. Yeah. Twelve days. The Andes. Yeah. And then they, when they got to the other side, they took a little short train into Santiago and they played cricket, billiards, and something else. I think it was polo. I think. Uh, against Santiago, so extraordinary that the, 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 the lengths they went to to try and play mainly cricket, because that at the time was the, the biggest of those three uh, those three sports. Incredible. But uh, yeah, it, it conjures for me. It conjures that, that 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 particular image conjures up a great one for me. You know, you could imagine the people of that era in their blazers on top of mules going over the Andes as they're as it's winding through this pass all to go and play a game of cricket in in Valparaiso. It's it's a wonderful. Wonderful kind of image. And Valparaiso, funny enough, mentioned that beautiful, beautiful ground there. Um, you know, we, we often, James and I often took the odd ex tourist excursion, and we'd sometimes find ourselves just being, you know, the, the, the task of the book would never be far from far from our thoughts. You know, we, we, we visited um, uh, the house of Pablo Neruda, who's a, who's a very famous Chilean poet. Uh, we, you know, went to view his house. He'd written lots of great works, South American poet. Uh, and, you know, he had all these wonderful periodicals on the on the wall, you know, a Hungarian journal and a French magazine. And I said to James, I said, is that a copy of Wisdom? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. So we, we were a bit close. Unfortunately, it wasn't. But that was how that was how much the, the kind of the, the task at hand had, had, had occupied. You see that primrose, primrose yellow. You sort of think. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Chile was it was it was you know, extraordinary contrast in Chile. I mean, really, Argentina. Um, you know, everyone who we've spoken to beforehand and all the research we've done had suggested that was going to be the the sort of strongest country. And it's it's, it's appropriate really that we're in the Union Jack Club uh, because it was in 1806 that the first cricket was played in South America by British soldiers uh, who were trying to take Buenos Aires and Montevideo from the Spanish. Um, it didn't go very well. I think it lasted about 15 days or something. 
Um, they thought they could just march in and take it, and that would be it. Um, uh, obviously, the Spanish rallied around and took it back fairly quickly. But they did manage to play cricket in the meantime. Uh, and they did manage to, uh, to play the first cricket at all in South America. And from there, the game got established from the 1820s onwards. And uh, one of the shirts we've got here is the, is the North shirt, North of Argentina. Uh, so this is, this is a fixture that dates back to 1892. And so that started because um, there were a group of clubs in the north of Argentina, right in the north, um, uh, in sugar plantation territory. And they decided they were going to take on Buenos Aires. Fairly you know, extraordinary, really. But that was the extent of um, the, 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 the coverage and the extent of the railways. Because it, you know, cricket had got there because the railways had, had gone all the way through Argentina. Uh, and all these people had settled there and decided they want to form cricket clubs. And so they started, they started a challenge match in that year to, to play against the South, which is quite a, you know, mainly Buenos Aires. And, and this, this, so this fixture still goes on today, which is fairly extraordinary. Still a three-day game, would you believe, in there, even in the era of white ball. And all the associate nations these days are driven by, by white ball cricket, of course. But even still today, it's a, it's a three-day game. Now, does anybody here know who was the first international cricket match? Who was it between? Does anybody know? Canada and USA. Canada and USA. The man is correct there. Now, what was the second? No one knows the second. Argentina. Uruguay, Uruguay, Uruguay and Argentina. You're correct, Charles. Uruguay and Argentina. So yeah, it's a it's a it's a Uruguay Argentina predates the Ashes. That's how long cricket has been going in South America. Yeah. I mean, again, an extraordinary story because um, in 1864, I think it was uh, the Buenos Aires Cricket Club inaugurated their new pavilion. And then there was endless war in Uruguay, so endless wars. I mean, it's confusing, just so many different wars. But in the end, the HMS Bombay, which is a British ship, obviously, sailed through uh, the Rio de la Plata, the River Plate, and played against um, played against the Buenos Aires Cricket Club and the Montevideo Cricket Club. And then four years later, the Buenos Aires Cricket Club and the Montevideo Cricket Club decided to play each other as Argentina against Uruguay in 1868. And that was the first, that was the first match between those two countries. Um, yeah, amazing, really. But that just shows that um, the extent that cricket was there already. It had been, been played for 40, 50 years already. And actually, in 1865, I think it was, although I have to check the book, um, there was a women's team that played uh, in Belgrano in, Bu in Buenos Aires. Now, Belgrano, if you ever get the chance to go to Argentina, you've got to go to Belgrano because it's, it's, got, it's one of the most evocative uh, grounds that I've seen in world cricket. Um, it, there's these massive tower blocks all the way around the ground. Um, and that was where, in that, in that district where this women's team played. Now, if that's correct, and we've tried to find more information on this team, that would make them the first women's club in the world, even before England, which is extraordinary, but that's what we found. Um, so yeah, Belgrano, um, I would highly recommend it. Although there's all these tower blocks, all these windows, beating reflecting the sun back at you so i can imagine on a hot day it's particularly difficult and there are records of uh, when the new zealand team that went there in the 1970s one of the batsmen collapsed there and had to be revived by a, by a, a gin and tonic or something um, <laughs> because it was so hot in the bar so yeah um now the the, the title of the book uh, anyone wondering what we had some alternative titles maybe we should maybe we should give some exclusive here and tell the alternative, well, the alternative title titles. the alternative titles was uh Pinochet's, I was stumped by Pinochet's grandson. I think that was one, which didn't quite make the, uh, make the cut. Uh, but yeah, we, 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 this story we, we managed to find a little bit more about. Uh, it was, there was bits of information about the story, but we were able to put a lot more kind of flesh on the bone with, the, uh, with, this, particular, with this particular story. Yeah, so, so you explain a little bit of the background, James, about, sure. about, about how this came to be. So I, mean, I think broadly speaking, you know, um, the Brits had had a massive influence in Argentina going back, you know, a lot of the railways were British owned and so on. And there've been this sort of glory days of British people. I imagine a lot of people here will know someone who went out to Argentina or Brazil. If you go back to the early part of the 20th century, I have a relative who went out to Brazil to, to work in various industries. So the British have done rather well. And then along comes uh, General Perón um, who doesn't like the fact that the British are doing rather well and decides that he wants to sort of rebalance the economy. And obviously his wife agrees with him. <laughs> uh, and they uh, get into power in the, in the 1940s. And then um, it crops up uh, that um, Evita is going to make a, a journey to Europe. And she'd quite like to meet the Queen. Um, 
And unfortunately, uh, the Queen didn't have time to, to meet her. Uh, they organised various junkets for her, you know, going to Royal Ascot or whatever, didn't really cut the mustard. She wanted to meet, you know, have a proper state visit um, with the red carpet rolled out. It didn't get offered to her. I think James has been quite generous on Evita there. <laughs> I think what happened is Evita said, oh, OK, I'm coming on this date. And then a week later, she said, oh, no, 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 I'm not coming on that date anymore. I'm coming on this date. And, and, you know, the British establishment said, OK, no problem. You can we'll sort it out for that date. And by about the fifth time of asking, I think the British establishment had got a bit peeved off with Evita mm. and said, OK, the Queen can no longer meet you anymore. You know, you've, you've messed us around kind of too much. I think, yeah. And um, so it didn't happen. She didn't meet the Queen. Uh, she didn't make it to Britain at all. She met Salazar in Portugal. I think she met Franco. That didn't go down very well with the Labour government either, understandably. understandably. Um, and, uh, and so she sailed home to, to Buenos Aires and never met the Queen. And uh, about five days later, the Buenos Aires Cricket Club lay in ruins. It wasn't just that. Um, she had a social welfare foundation where she was trying to you know, give young people a chance. Uh, and the Buenos Aires Cricket Club refused to hand over their, uh, their, their grounds, their beautiful grounds that have been there since the 1860s, to her social aid foundation. And um, that hadn't gone down very well either. And so um, rather mysteriously, um, someone set a light to the uh, Buenos Aires Cricket Club pavilion. And that was the end of that. So um, this was a pavilion that housed all of the wonderful, you know, Buenos Aires Cricket Club was the MCC of, of Argentina. It was a beautiful old building, a, a wonderful traditional pavilion. It housed all this, this literature and, and beautiful paintings and, and all the history of, of, of Argentine cricket. And, and because obviously, you know, Evita wasn't particularly uh, enamoured with the British, it, it just went down in flames. So. Yeah, uh, and then, you know, the massive, just, just quickly, you know, obviously anyone who's studied their history will know that you know, there's been a, you know, MCC toured there several times. So there's a massive footprint of, of cricket in Argentina. And they're still, they're still probably the strongest uh, side today. You know, there's still, there's still some great clubs in, our, in Buenos Aires that, that, that follow the game, multi-sports clubs. So, you know, it, I think it, it was quite a wounding thing to people there at the time, what happened. And sadly, cricket has declined a bit in Argentina. And um, it's going to take a, a, a quite a concerted effort to get it going again. Um, yeah, so... Um, Quite sad going there, bittersweet going there, but you could still sense the the gravity of, 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 of the sort of cricket that we played there. Yeah, there's a, there was a wonderful a wonderful trophy that was that was played for in uh, in the eighties, James, oh God, yeah, which God. maybe you wanna you wanna expand on a little bit. Yes, more. obviously we know there was a certain war that went on in nineteen eighty two, and um, Argentina had been invited to the ICC trophy that year, and they were swiftly disinvited, <laughs> um, and they played in seventy nine. Did okay, but they and they didn't get they got invited in eighty two and they got disinvited. Um, so yeah, there was a, there was a chap we met um, who did his best to try and reunite, get the British back together again. And his way of doing it was to um, obviously we know all about um, Argentina and the Falkland Islands. What's the Falkland Islands famous for apart from apart from uh, seals? Sheep. It's probably famous for sheep. So he took a sheep's bone, the bone of contention, he called it. It could only mean one thing, the bone of contention. And so <laughs> the Hurling Club play against the British, the Hurling Club of Argentina play against the British Embassy uh, for the bone of contention. And the bone of contention is, I think, a metaphor for something that we could probably get. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, incidentally, when the uh, when Falkland Islands were elected to the ICC, uh, you yeah. can imagine who the one objector was to the... They abstain. Uh, they abstain, abstain, sorry. Abstain. Abstention yeah. to, their, uh, to their application. Yeah. But, yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, Argentina. I mean, the, the, the pedigree of the of the cricket there is 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 incredibly strong historically. It's the it's the one country where there is that real uh, footprint in the game, and and there is a bit of kind of when you see rugby now becoming so preeminent in a lot of other countries, it, it kind of feels in a way. This is the broader theme of of maybe cricket's miss, missed opportunity. Um, rugby sevens now is in is in the Olympics. Now we know. Fantastically, before we wrote the book, it was we didn't know what cricket was going to make it into the Olympics or not. And, and people forget this about cricket in the Olympics that everyone focuses on that top bracket of, of India, of England, of Australia. Oh, the calendar's already too busy. But for a lot of these countries in, in Latin America and, and in other parts of the world, um, cricket in the Olympics is a, is a key thing. One reason, one reason only funding, because they don't get any funding from central government if it's not an Olympic sport. Football is an Olympic sport that gets funding. Volleyball, whatever you like, it's all Olympic sports. Cricket in the Olympics means absolutely everything 
for small countries where the game is is kind of growing and that's where it's important for the ICC to to really put their foot down on this one for the Olympics because it means that cricket can truly become we consider it a global game already but it can become a true global game not just a sport that is you know perceived to be a global game but a true global game and I think that's a really a really you know a landmark decision that, that happened recently that the ICC are really are really going to press ahead with that. So obviously moving on from Argentina and Uruguay into Brazil, which was, you know, Brazil is obviously, you know, think of football mainly. Now, Brazil is obviously a massive country. Logistically, this was quite a challenge, really. Um, there were games played all over Brazil, um, obviously mainly Rio and Sao Paulo, and obviously also in a meat factory way in the middle of nowhere in a place called Barretos, which, um, which was intriguing. Um, uh, and also way up in the, in the northeast uh, as well, and also Manaus, where England football team famously played uh, several years ago. We took a ferry up, up, the, up the river, which was interesting because the ferry sunk in February 20th. Two years after we Two were there, fortunately. Year, so that was interesting. Um, but so yeah, yeah, we had this, we had this romantic idea of, of sailing down the Amazon and, you know, the beautiful clear sky above us every night. I can tell you, or, you know, we had to, we had to hang our own kind of hammocks I can tell you after two days, you know, that, that quickly faded with the mozzies biting you and covering yourself in whatever. And the Zika swel- the, well. Yeah, with Zika thing and sweltering heat. You know, the kind of romantic idea of, of sailing up the Amazon was, was quickly, uh, quickly kind of forgotten. But it, yeah, it was challenging, but fun. But fun. We, did find, we did find historical, um, historical cricket having been played there. So it was worth it. But um, yeah, that was very much for, for the labour of, of, of the whole of, of people. I did forget, before we got to Brazil, we went through Paraguay. Paraguay, a fascinating, fascinating kind of country. And this is where we kind of discovered one of the real stellar stories of the book, I would say, something I certainly knew nothing about. There was a, um, a group of Australian uh, socialists they were, who were unhappy with the, the shearers strike in, uh, in the sheep shearers strike in kind of the 1870s, 1880s. And they, they wanted to leave Australia and set up a new Australia, something that was more built around their idea, the utopian ideas of socialism, of teetotalism, of, of certain certain attitudes. So, so where to do this? Naturally, Paraguay is where they were, where they went. So they sailed from Australia, 120 people. Uh, Paraguay at this time had just emerged from the War of the Triple Alliance, where their population, the male population, had been you know decimated to, to 20,000. I mean, there were 20,000 very lucky fellas, but there were 20,000 fellas <laughs> nonetheless. And so they, this, you know, they were, they were desperate for people to come from all over, all over the world to start again in, um, in Paraguay. Uh, and these Australian utopian socialists went there. And of course, you know, Aust- Aussies being Aussies brought cricket with them. So in the middle of Paraguay, in the middle of Paraguay, in the, in the kind of the scrubland in the middle of nowhere, they, they cut the turf and they rolled the turf and they prepared and they cut out from the jungle a, a cricket pitch and they played cricket in Paraguay. And, and of course, there were some Brits there with the railways uh, in a place called Villa Rica, which is probably about 100 miles from uh, Ascension. And um, they challenged the Brits to the game. So the most unorthodox ashes contest mm. took place in a place called Cosme in the middle of Paraguay. I mean, who'd have thought that that Ashes rivalry could, could just be reinvigorated in, in that part of the world? Mm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it's, I suppose, you know, what, what's heartening is that, um, you know, uh, when we went back and looked through Argentina, there was a little period there where there were lots of Argentines playing the game. There's still quite a few today. And I suppose this is the whole point, you know, you want the locals to take up the game and really become serious about it. And that's where it's quite heartening about Brazil now, because there's a, there's a little spa town uh, not far from Sao Paulo, I think. Yeah, Poços de Caldas. Poços de Caldas, a spa town, where they've basically centred the Brazil Cricket Association and they've, you know, they've got a, they've got local boys and girls who are studying cricket at school and university and they're actually becoming coaches and really taking up the game. So that's a real hope for the future that that there's that cricket will really might take off in South America. Um, and as Tim says, you know, the Olympics are going to be crucial about that. But yeah, that was a, a, a quite heartening thing to see. One, one of the incredible things about, about that story in Brazil, excuse me, is, um, is they've actually been central contracts yeah. to 14 of the women players. The men don't have central contracts, but the women have central contracts. Their reasoning is that 
okay, we can we can make huge progress here quickly. I don't know if anyone knows the story of the Thailand women's national team who've as, as something James and I covered in, in cricket around the world, who've who've really risen from nothing to, to taking part in the World Cup. And and Brazil, Brazil, huge country, you know. It's never going to beat football. Cricket in Brazil is never going to beat football. But there's enough people you can get interested who might, you know, might take the game to their hearts, might start loving the sport that it can grow. So they've, they've, yeah, particularly amongst women, they they feel that this is an area. So they've got they've handed out 14 central contracts, and and they're about to take play a qualifier against the, the US, uh, Canada, and, Ar- and Argentina. Uh, I think next month in uh, in Mexico, it's actually taking place. Um, and yeah, they're, they're hopeful that they can they can they can make the World Cup. But who knows? It might you know the T20 World Cup. It, it, it might happen. But that's a that, that's a sign of the kind of ambition that these these women there are, are professional. They're, they're, it's their job. Their job every day is to to come and train. And who'd have thought that in Brazil? In Brazil, the women are professional cricketers. It's a it's an incredible incredible story. All Brazilian. All Brazilian. Wonderful story. Yeah. So, so the last leg of the journey, the last little bit, we obviously got out of Brazil up to the. The Guyanas, if you want to call it that, and obviously Guyana <laughs> itself being a part of the West Indies, we thought, well, that's been done already. Best not to dwell too much on that. But French Guyana and Suriname, uh, French Guyana, you might have, if you've read the book Papillon or seen the film with Steve McQueen and Dustin mm-hmm. Hoffman, you'll know all about that. Uh, but there is cricket in French Guyana. They had, they were, they, it was played on the edge of the, uh, on, on the edge of the prison camp. I believe. Yeah, on the edge of the, they played, they played in, they played in French Guyana in. Um... Yeah, around the time that, that Papillon was there, there was, there, was, there was guards, again, who were, who were aspirational for certain European values and maybe British values, and they, and they, played, they, they played cricket there. But, but probably one of the most interesting things about, about cricket in, uh, in French Guyana, it's actually the place, French Guyana, I mean, they take Euros there. I couldn't believe that when we crossed the border and you're spending Euros in Latin America, it seemed ridiculous. But the most amazing thing there was it's actually where they launch all the satellites into into space from Europe. So the BBC or whoever, all launched from um, from from French Guyana. So you'd have cricket matches interrupted by these rockets <laughs> going up, taking these satellites into into space. I mean, there's not many not many cricket clubs can 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 kind of claim <laughs> that really. So that's in Karoo, which is a uh, which is actually the port you take to go out to to Devil's Island. Where um, where Papillon was uh, well, he actually wasn't in turn there, but yeah, he claimed he was. Um, and yeah, so from the thing about French Guyana, a, a very strange country, really. Um, it's there's there's no public buses there, so that would pr- produce a bit of a logistical challenge for for kind of James and I. So so the only real way to get around French Guyana if you don't own a car is to is to kind of stick your thumb out on the road and. My mum was like, oh no, you can't, you can't be doing that. There's all sorts of weird people around, you know, you know what they're gonna to do to you, you know, take you off into the jungle and whatever. But fortunately, you know, most people seem it seemed like a common thing. People were picking up hitchhikers all the time. Now, what we didn't expect, which is perhaps what I picked up hitchhikers, you know, but every time we, we went from A to B, the person would turn around and hold the hand out. And I'd be expected to be paid for the journey. So as a you know, it was a public pass, basically. Yeah. So you know, you'd have to you'd have to right. kind of scrounge amongst your pockets to find to give them five euros or six euros in uh, yeah, interesting, interesting country. And yeah, from there it was on to on to Suriname, which uh, you know, I, 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 obviously I'm very passionate about Latin America, but Suriname is a place that really fascinated me. Nobody, nobody really knows much about it, even even the people there that said, you know, no, nobody kind of comes here. You know, I don't think I saw very many tourists there. Um, it's this fascinating little little Dutch enclave, but the but the culture of the place is is incredible. You've got Anglican churches built by the Dutch next to mosques, next to Hindu temples, next to you know, it's just an incredibly multicultural uh, kind of microcosm of the world, all in all all in kind of one place, and the cricket there. Brought by brought by the Dutch and, and to an extent the British as well. They used to play out in the in the rice the rice polders where they grew the rice in uh, in, in Suriname. And we actually encountered a very a very interesting guy there who was uh, the head of cricket in a place called New Nikeri. And one of the great pastimes in in Suriname is something called bird whistling competitions. Bird whistling competitions. Okay, what you have to do you have to, you train your bird to whistle okay <laughs> so you, you to get it to sing as much as you can so it has to you kind of have a clock 
and you have to try and encourage your, your bird to, to sing as many times in a minute or 10 minutes or whatever as it, as, as it can. So you play off against other birds. This is a ridiculous game. I know this is a huge thing. It's, <laughs> honestly, it's a huge, these birds sell for $2,000. It's crazy, 2,000 pounds they sell, crazy. And it's the bird that can record the most amount of songs in a, in a, in a set period against another bird and somebody's there chalking up the amount of time. And the cricket games don't start to the bird. The, this is it. The, bird, the bird wrestling competitions take place in the morning. So that allows the, you know, you to, to watch the cricket in the, in the afternoon. Now, the guy who, who we met was, was hugely into this. And there's a great photo of him in, in the book. In fact, I'm not, I, might, I might just dig it out now. I don't even see it from a distance. But it's a, it's a wonderful photo. So there he is. Probably a bit far away, but you can maybe just about see that. He's, he's there with his bird below the scoreboard. And he... Um, when that's we were the on the scoreboard. that's the cricket scoreboard. When we were on the way to the ground, when we were on the way to the ground, and he was showing this, he was he was whistling to himself, and we were thinking, is he in a good mood or is he just training? Is this a last minute training session? We couldn't. <laughs> it was a training session. It was a training <laughs> session. I think like we, we we couldn't quite tell. But that was you know part of the beautiful, fantastic, different cultures that we that we that we kind of experienced you know kind of throughout our. Uh, throughout our journey. So, yeah, so we, we probably only scratched the surface there, but, yeah. you know, that, that, that's a microcosm of what, what, what we sort of experienced. And yeah, if, and perhaps, I, I don't know, Nick, you want to probably pause now? And then yeah, we'll I think, I mean, that was, uh, I'm just going to pause the recording. Um,